<laughs> the greatest. All right, cuz I like it, man. It gets better and better each time I watch it. No, I gotta we gotta drop in that new picture. In fact, I saw you post it. It's legendary. It's Baldy and Mike Piazza on uh-huh. Hermosa Beach. Yes. All right. So yeah. I will send it to the guys so they can drop that picture in. No that in. is a legendary picture. Yeah, that was uh we were training at my buddy's place in Hermosa the yard, and Piazza, if you notice, he's got a broken thumb. So um, you know, he he was he was doing all this conditioning and stuff on the beach. I was out there trying to keep my career going, whatever. It's like probably 95, 94, 95. And so we were we were out there every morning together, man. So that that picture popped up. Somebody sent it to me the other day. I, I put it back out there. Was he um with, with he was with the Mets at that time, right? I think Am he I was sure? with the Dodgers at the time. Okay. I think. But he he, he was sort of like I, I remember when he was with the Mets. I remember the the All Star game. I remember he, in Philadelphia at Veterans Stadium, he had a home run in yeah. the All Star game. Like he was out of the park before anybody could blink. Um, but he might. Nah, I think he was with the Dodgers at the time, cuz he he was. Uh, he, he, well, we all oh, we uh, we've gotten people are asking too. If you could send us a picture of you running with the Bulls, if you could find that too, you in Spain, we want to we want to put that one in the opening too. Okay. All right. All right. I mean, you know, this is this is uh, mid '90s now. There wasn't ex- exactly a whole lot of cameras around. Um, <laughs> nobody was carrying any camera with them. Although one of the things they did, uh, they might still do it. I haven't run, you know, since then. But one of the things they did. This is '95 is they had, Fuji had these cameras set up along the, the, the track and they just snapped pictures like nonstop. So you would go and you would see all the pictures that they posted um, and you they, they would probably catch you during the run, um, with the bull near in, in the vicinity, whatever. And then you would just order those pictures and that's how they did it back then. Oh, that's fantastic. That's good. Yeah. yeah, we definitely need that. But that picture of you and Piazza, you, you would look like, uh, like a wrestler, you you were you you were in heavy playing days. Yes. So you yeah. had to be what fifty pounds heavier. Yeah, I I thought that um, at that time in my life, I thought everybody should weigh three hundred pounds once in their life. There and it is. I thought like <laughs> life began at three hundred. So I was probably two ninety five, but you know I I think I did get over to like I, I pushed up to like three oh two at one point. And I, that was, you know, that was the biggest and strongest I ever got in my life at that point. Yeah, but you, you weren't, you weren't heavy. Like you were thick. Like you were put, yeah. put together. People. No, no, I was strong. I was strong. Yeah. I was like, we were doing heavy bench, heavy deadlifts at the time. Like we were lifting for, you know, we were lifting for maximum muscle at that point. What were you, what were you benching at that point? I, I, I'll never forget because. I was at this uh, world gym on a Friday night and uh, I took 465 off the rack and bench 465. I had a bench press shirt yeah. on, but I took 465, no spotters. I took it off the rack. You know, I pressed it one time. That was my 465 was my all time best. 465 without 465. a spotter? My no, Lord. 465. Yeah, tell I me, mean, I didn't think it was a legit bench. If you didn't take it off the rack yourself, like if oh a, a spider was God. taking you and setting you up to lift it, right? I didn't think that was an official lift. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. Four sixty. Wow, that's crazy. All right, let's get to our uh, draft, our meat locker mock draft. I got, I got to ask you about something because I heard. Now, I, we'll see, but you know, I heard you draft a lot of talk, Washington. Has is enamored with JJ McCarthy. Okay. I, I, I gotta tell you, I, I don't understand it. Like, you got Jaden Daniels sitting there or JJ McCarthy. I, I, to me, it's a no brainer. You gotta go Jaden Daniels. I find it hard to believe. I mean, you know, maybe Cliff Kingsbury sees something. I mean, he's the new offense coordinator, he's coached Johnny Menzel, Patrick Mahomes, Baker Mayfield. He's coached a bunch of guys that were, you know, first round draft picks. But I find it hard to believe that uh, Washington is going to forego Jaden Daniels 
Because I see a lot of drafts have Jaden Daniels, like, for example, our lads has Jaden Daniels as their number one ranked quarterback. That doesn't mean that Chicago's going to take Jaden Daniels, but they have him as the ranked, number one ranked quarterback. Uh, I don't see anybody having Jay. So let me ask you this, cuz. Yeah. We've all watched, you know, we, we met Michael Penix, we met his agent, we've watched a b- bunch of Washington tape. Nobody threw the ball um, deeper, more frequently, and better than Washington did. If you took J.J. McCarthy and put him in Washington's offense, would they be 14 and 0 and on the brink of winning a national championship? No, like, I don't no, believe that. No. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe it either. I don't, first of all, he doesn't have the arm talent that Penix has. Penix's arm talent is, is off the charts ridiculous. I mean, we, we saw, especially if you go and watch that Texas game, and, and we did, and you saw that down the field in the drop in the bucket shots. We're, we're insane. You can talk all you want about his receivers, and they're very good, but he was putting stuff in tight windows. Yeah, no, all day, all game long. And, um, you know, just touch throws, every type of throw that you could. Like, if you wanted to put the highlight tape together of a quarterback for this draft, I mean, you could just take eight throws from the Texas game and go, here's my highlight reel. Go, you know, find a flaw. So, I don't – I have not heard – the what you've heard, like the enamor, I, I kind of hear chalk, like Caleb Chicago, Jaden Washington, and in my mock, I had New England trading back, but I, may I hear Drake to New England, and the draft starts at four with Arizona, and whether they take uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. or one of the receivers or trade out, I kind of feel like that's where the draft is going to start, which is a little departure from what we talked about last week in my first ten. But it, look, these things, you know. Mel Kiefer Jr. is up to the fourth mock draft. Daniel Jeremiah will have his fourth oh, mock this draft. Two point oh, man. They're, 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 listen, as more information and, and yes. stuff leaks out, you know, and listen, it's a small world, right? Like, so you know, all it takes is stuff to come out, and you kind mm-hmm. of figure out what's real, what's not real. But yeah. it's legitimate. Like teams' boards are already set, and yeah. you kind of have an idea. They know who they're looking at, and. This is where stuff kind of, this time of the year where it filters out. Well, it does filter. I mean, sometimes it is put out there and it's put through, you know, the the guys that broadcast this stuff. You know, I'm the Adam Schefters or Ian Rappaports or Jay Glazers. There's stuff that comes out on by the agents, uh, by teams for for a variety of different reasons, smoke screens, you name it. But I think the big thing, like for example, I'm going to be on Total Access NFL Network tomorrow. And they said, what, what, like, you have suggestions? And I said, look, let's just take a couple of teams. Like, I just said, let's take the Pittsburgh Steelers, whoever won a playoff game since 2016, they're picking number 20. And let's take, let's take the Chargers at number five. Like, let's have a real war room debate. What's the best player to take for the Chargers at five to get out of this malaise that they've been in, get to the playoffs and win a playoff game? And the same thing with the Steelers. Like, you can make a case that Jim Harbaugh and, you know, their new general manager, like, they could easily go right tackle at that spot. They could go Malik Neighbors, Romadunzi at that spot. Like, they could trade out of the spot. Um, You know, you could look at Pittsburgh and go, boy, they started building the offensive line last year. Roderick Jones, Isaac Salemato. Let's go get ourselves a starting center since we don't really have one right now. Or you could go, you know, you could go receiver. They just lost Deontay Johnson. They got George Pickens. And so my, my point to the network was, let's just have real debates. Like, what's the best player, if they're both available, that helps our team the most, the quickest? Like, we saw the day the Eagles traded for A.J. Brown during the draft, they got better. They got so good that they went all the way to the brink of winning the Super Bowl. So one player at the right spot can certainly make a big difference. You. It can springboard you. Yeah, and, well, I, and I it's interesting. Of you brought up the Chargers. Let me ask you about the Chargers because you got no Mike Williams, you got no Keenan Allen, right? So you you got to give your star quarterback. You, it's paramount, and I love all like we talk about it all the time. But you got to give him a weapon, and Neighbors is ridiculous. I mean, yeah. well, I, I, mean I, you know, I, I know that's not Harbaugh's mo, but and he's an O line guy. But how do you not give your quarterback what he needs? 
Well, I'm not sure how, how you do that. You could say you want to run the ball and you're going to emphasize the run, and, and they're going to do that. And they'll draft a running back. It wouldn't surprise me to see Blake Corum coming. But at the end of the day, what are you doing on third and 13? What are you doing when it's third down and seven at the seven? Are you kicking a field goal or are you scoring a touchdown? And who are you throwing it to? So, like, you, you need receivers that can, A, beat man coverage, B, that are dangerous after the catch, like you just think about what San Francisco does with Debo and with Ayuk and with Kittle and how they just extend eight-yard catches into 20-yard games. It happens all the time. Like So I do think that right tackle is in play. It, it has been a position of need for that team, and it would, but you can't get everything. But you better help your quarterback out, and you better give him a go-to guy. He just lost his go-to guy every day since he's been there in Keenan Allen. Like, he had his best year of his career last year. And you lose him, and you lose, you know, Michael Williams to the Jets. To me, it's screaming wide receiver. It, by the way, he's the best quarterback Harbaugh will have coached. Yeah. Yeah, by far. And so, you know, I mean, you could go back to San Francisco days, Michigan days. Like, yeah, he hasn't had a guy. I mean, I I, I employ I, – I make everybody – that is on the fence about Justin Herbert. Just go and watch that guy throw a football in pregame warm up and yeah. tell me you don't come away going, that's as good a that's as good an arm talent as you're gonna see that you've ever seen. I mean, he's he is a phenomenal, phenomenal talent. All right, so we have neighbors going five. So now it's uh it, New England with Drake May, uh Marvin Jr. to Arizona, neighbors to the Chargers. The Giants have to take J.J. at six, no? If he's sitting there at six, I I, I feel like it's going to be hard for them to pass it up. I, I just can't believe that an organization that did not draft Daniel Jones had one good year with them, had his third major injury last year with the ACL after two major neck injuries. One knocked him out for the season. I find it hard to believe that Joe Shane, the general manager, Brian Dable, the head coach, is it going to say, let's let's start giving ourselves some real quarterback insurance here? Because they don't know when Daniel Jones is going to be come back after that ACL tear and surgery. Like, I don't know when he's going to be ready. They don't know. And so you better start looking at the future if you want to have long-term tenure with the New York Giants. And to me, that's – if J.J. is there, they don't have to lose any assets to go get him. I think that's what they're going to do. You know, it's interesting, too, because you have Minnesota, the Raiders. I mean, those teams need quarterbacks. You know, you could make a case for Denver. I mean, like, you look at it's those, true. you know, you, it, and then you look at Arizona and you go, you know, does Arizona, I mean, you could get some lot of draft capital by moving that pick. Like those quarterbacks. You, get, you, you know, you might, I, I think the fan base, not that you want to always appease the fan base. I think the fans, and I think Kyler Murray are going, just give, let, let's just start this with Marvin Harrison. Yeah. Last year, they not traded back. Last year, they traded back. Then they traded up and they took Paris Johnson Jr. He played every single snap at right tackle and was a good player for him. Yeah. Well coached, good player, upgraded right tackle for him. Like, Sometimes you just got to hit solid doubles, cuz. And you just got to, like, try not to get too cute and too fancy. Just go get solid players and just keep building. You know, I mean, if you think about the Arizona Cardinals, they came to Philadelphia in December and they whipped the Eagles. They beat the Dallas Cowboys early in the year. They went to Pittsburgh and whipped Pittsburgh. I mean, those are three playoff teams yeah. that they beat last year with yeah. a very limited roster. No, I feel you. It's just interesting. Because you're right, the draft starts there, and Arizona and the Chargers are both going to be fielding a lot of calls. Uh, at seven, Joe Alt is a lock, right? It, it feels like he has to go seven. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, it's about they have, they have made the change at general manager. They've made, they've made the change at head coach. All right, you know, um, Brian Callahan brings in his father, okay, to be the offensive line coach, run game coordinator. They're going to get better. But give, you know, give Coach Callahan, give him Joe Alt to work with opposite Peter Skaronsky from last year. 
Yeah. Let him start putting this offensive line together like Callahan's done from the day he came to Philadelphia in 1995 with Gruden and Sean Payton, all the guys that came here. Like he's been building offensive lines everywhere he's ever been. Give him a piece, like a, a, a massive um, technician that Joe Alt is and with what Skaronsky showed last year, and you can start putting the pieces together to protect a Will Levis. All right. Uh, what about the Falcons now at eight? Are you still where, – where are you at with – the Falcons. Well, I, I feel like there's a curveball that can happen with Atlanta. I mean, yeah. it makes all the sense in the world to go get Dallas Turner or Jared Verse. It's yep. a position of need. It's it's a they're, they're, the players are of that value. They're top ten selections, but and and maybe they do that. Maybe they just simply add to the defense. The defense at one point before they collapsed at the end of the year was a top ten defense, and Jesse Bates was a big addition and. The two young linebackers, Landmark, they were good. I feel like this is where we could get a real curveball. And this here's why, because, like, I feel like I know Arthur Blank really well. Yeah. I worked for the Falcons. I announced their preseason games for years. I was around him a lot. And the year I took over as the lead announcer for the Falcon preseason games, the year they, they brought in Mike Smith as a head coach, and they drafted Matt Ryan. And they went from 3-13, and 13 and they made the playoffs. They turned their team around in one year. Arthur Blank has never forgotten that. They've never been relevant since Matt Ryan sorted, started fading. They've tried a bunch of coaches. GMs are in there. And now they spent a lot of money on Kirk Cousins. And maybe, maybe that helps them win the division this year. But they still need a quarterback. Like they're, And this might be the year to get it. You might just say, you know what? I don't know if, if Michael Penix... Like, I think they're interested in Michael Penix. Like, I don't – maybe it's too rich at eight. Maybe they trade back. Maybe they trade back into the first round if he slips. And I'm just throwing Michael's name out there. But I feel like the Falcons, maybe not at eight, but either down the board or back into the first round late, I feel like I feel like they're in the quarterback market. And nobody's wow. talking I mean, about they it. Spent all that I just money feel on like this is, this is – and look, Kirk Cousins got a boatload of money. I got it, but he's not. He's thirty-five, coming off a you know an Achilles injury. We don't know what that long term is going to look like for him. Yeah. Um, I, we all hope that all these guys play as long as they can, but they still going to need a quarterback at some point. No, you're right. I just think it's just it's wild because you're in that spot and you spent all that money, and I think they want to try to win, right? Like they want to try to win now. So I like their defense. So that you had verse there before, I think if, if I'm in that war room, I'm arguing for verse. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, he's a true four three defensive end. He's got length. Um, you know, you look at Atlanta's defense right now, and you know, Anyamata and Jarrett are solid inside. And, you know, they've got uh Ebikati, who's a young player from Penn State, looks like he's an ascending player, but they they need they need a, a star off the edge. Now they have missed on a lot of defensive ends. You know, in the last 15 years, they missed, you know, and those players are, you know, they were run out of this league pretty quickly. But I feel like Jared Verse isn't a pumped up defensive end. I feel like, you know, his size and his, uh, you know, what he showed at Florida State yeah. is kind of what first round defensive ends look like. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Then you had Turner, well, another guy I love who's, who just has got great ferocity off the edge going to Chicago. You still feel that? I do, except if Roma Dunze is there. If a Dunze is there, I still think that he could be a play. It could be one of those discussions where you just go, you just give Caleb all the all of the help that they could use. Um, if Joe Alt was there for wow. some reason, well, if Tennessee passed on him, and I don't think Atlanta or Chicago is going to, you know, I I think Chicago. If Joe Alt was there, that would be one of those discussions. Do we go defensive end opposite Montez Sweat? and complete this defense and improve as much as any in the league last year? Do we go left tackle and say, okay, Braxton Jones has been a good player, but maybe we could get a great player at that position and give Caleb all the help up front he can use with three good running backs that they have on the roster? Or do we go, let's just give Caleb another young player that he can grow with when Keenan Allen retires or, you know, whatever, DJ Moore fades, whatever might happen. 
Like, let's just get one more. Like, I think all those things could be in play. But ultimately, I think they take the defensive end. Uh, then you got your Jets, who and Rome, you said, is in play there, uh, obviously with Rodgers. Uh, do you go? I mean, you got some value there, too. You got two of the, you get the two best cornerbacks still on the board. You have all those well, yeah. old, and you old linemen, and, too. And, 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 Jet fans would say, well, yeah, but we've got Sauce Gardner, we've got DJ Reed, and, you know, we've got Michael Carter Jr. Like, we're, we're, we're set at corner. Okay, but what if you could get the best corner and go, all right, DJ Reed's our third corner, and let's go put the best Terry and Arnold, whatever. Let's go put Arnold next to Sauce, and let's just make it with a, maybe the best pass rushing defensive line and maybe the best tandem of corners. You just make it hard to, like, throw touchdowns. Yeah. You know like, yeah. yeah, you know, you just go, well, the number one ranked defense like that. Yeah. There is, I'm not saying Joe Douglas isn't thinking like that at all because they, because uh, you could go, if Rome was there, that makes sense for Aaron Rodgers. Like, okay, let's go Garrett Wilson, Michael Williams. We don't know when he's going to be ready. Let's get Roma Dunze. And if Aaron Rodgers plays a year, two years, we still got a receiving core of Garrett Williams, Roma Dunze, blah, blah, blah. Or you could go, Brock Bowers, they've got a deep tight end room right now. Well, they have like four tight ends. They do. They, they have four, as a matter of fact. And they like all four of them. But this is a player that you have to really account for uh, in Brock Bowers, where if you build your offense around when Minnesota really started building their offense a little bit around TJ Hawkinson, he became what looked like a guy that you could – Okay, say this is what a first round, you know, top ten tight end looks like. Some days he looks like that guy, and but you have to you have to feature that. I don't think it's a high priority, you know, for them right now because the the roster right now at tight end is simply this: Tyler Conklin, Jeremy Ruckert, who is a yeah. year removed from plantar foot shitis, uh, Kenny Yudbaugh, and Zach Coons, who they drafted last year. So they are four deep at that position right now. You know what's interesting is the tight end spot, right? Like, if you have an elite tight end, you win. Chiefs, obviously. Niners, Kittle, right? Baltimore you know, was interesting because Andrews gives away the likely. Both played huge parts in their offenses, right? You mentioned Detroit. Uh, I mean, Buffalo. Like, you go around the league, those tight ends. And Bowers is fascinating. He's an interesting prospect because he is elite like he he's a game changer on offense he's a game changer and he's a he's a much better blocker than anybody thinks he is and yeah. he is very explosive after the catch and he's a good route runner his hands are sick just i mean the one-handed catches at georgia are crazy um how he adjusts to a ball um i don't know where he's going to go the jets might be the first landing spot for him. How about the Colts? Maybe he doesn't get past Denver if Denver just stays there at 12. Like, I think, you know, after the three receivers go, I feel like he's going to be the next receiver tight end to go. I feel like he's going to be the fourth. Colts are interesting for him. Yeah, Col Colts, I think they're leaning towards defense right now. Like, I feel like uh, Quinion Mitchell, Terry and Arnold, I feel like that's a position – that they, they really need to upgrade right now. They've got Juju Brents there, um, you know, who was a second-round pick a couple years ago. Uh, but I think they need a starter, like a true number one corner opposite. All right, so this is important for the Eagles. Where does the run of offensive linemen start, right? Because you have all those linemen, and then you look at the Eagles. And, guys, funny, uh, we you and I talked about Steen last year. He, everybody made a big deal. We talked about this morning with Bo, how Nick at the owners' meetings didn't put him in the mix for guard. He forgot his name. Now it was early. You could say he forgot his name, but it, it appears they're very tepid with Steen. I think they're looking to upgrade the position. Okay, um, so I think that's that's where they're at right now. They're going to have a center, Cam. You know, taking over for that's already an adjustment. Taking over for Kelsey. Um, the run on tackles, I believe, outside of Joe Alt, who looks right. like he's going to go in the top 10, probably Tennessee, I feel like it's going to start with the Raiders at 13 because they have a huge need at right tackle. The New Orleans Saints, they already 
fired their offensive line coach, Doug Marone, brought, you know, a new coach in. Um, so I feel like the, the Raiders, New Orleans, um, all, Cincinnati, like Cincinnati at 18, yeah. you know, they need a right tackle the worst way. you got to keep Joe Burrow upright. Yeah. So I feel like – and then Pittsburgh and Miami are certainly in play at center for sure and possibly tackle depending – on what Taron Armstead does at Miami. So Philly's picking 22, but you're saying the run. The run to be starts Raiders, New Orleans, Cincy, Pittsburgh, Miami, Philly. Like, I feel like there's a deep run on tackles and maybe because there's a couple of elite centers that could go in that mix as well. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. That's why you got to believe that Howie's got to trade up. To get one well, of those guys. They've got, they've got picks 50 and 53. Um, I, I feel like if they want to get, like, let's just say, Taliese Fuaga. Let's just say Fuaga falls below New Orleans. Say New Orleans doesn't think he'd play left tackle. And the Raiders say they take J.C. Lathan. And Fuaga's in play. And Cincinnati's there at 18. Maybe there's a trade there with Jacksonville or Seattle. You know, to to go get Fuaga because I think he's going to be. It won't surprise me if two years from now he's the best tackle in this draft. It just won't surprise me. Yeah, but, I agree with I you. Think, the people, are, there's people are calling on him. I don't understand that. Well, I, you're spot on. You love him. I agree. It's the same thing you do. Well, I think he also could play right guard, and <clears> I think you know, at 335 pounds, he's a greater you him, man. You you plug him next to Lane Johnson. I think Lane would be thrilled. Yeah, I think Jurgens would love it. He's an undersized center, and they would get back to, you know, that just that huge, in you know, just that big, strong offense line. Just keep it big and strong. You got Saquon back there. Go get yourself as good a run blocker as is in this whole draft. You play him at right guard. You value for him right away. And if something happens at the tackle position uh, down the road, you move him out to tackle. But I think. Like, that's where I think Howie, and I'm not, you know, it might be Fatano, like, if he starts to drop, but maybe you could get him at 22. Yeah. But I do think there is a player like Fuaga, and probably more than Olu, Fashanu, probably more than him, that the Eagles would be most interested in. Because I think Fashanu is clearly just a tackle. But Fuaga looks like he could be one of the, just a monster offensive guard. And I think you could put him in there. And so... Could Howie trade up and use one of those picks that he has? I think it's possible. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, brother, listen. Uh, what's on tap for you today? Do the Sixers win tomorrow night? And then uh, we'll convene on Friday. But what are you doing today? Uh, it's just all football. I, I mean, I'm literally looking at some of these uh, some of these smaller school guys right now. Just, you know, oh. like this kid, Jalex Hunt from Houston Christian. Right. Looks like he's got some boost to him because like I, he looks like a fifth round pick, fifth or sixth round pick to me with an upside to him with the right coach and right system. So anyways, looking at those guys, um, we've got a bunch of draft shows coming up uh, starting tomorrow. So I'm just getting myself prepared for all of it. I love it. I love the, your the sleepers. Sixers, the Sixers beat the Bulls. Like, I I, I think that, you know, they're going to be Miami. Good... Just FYI, it's okay. Miami tomorrow night. Okay. My, you're tomorrow you're night. down there. Like, so, you know, you could go represent the Sixers at a bar when they're watching it when everybody's all heated up. I could crash that party, cuz. That's possible. Yes. That's a possibility, yes. Baldy. I love it. Brother, Thanks, man. you're the greatest. We love you. See you Friday.